This is lesson four. Our topic is the minister's preparation. I'd like to go to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13 through verse 16, and we'll be reading from the New King James Version as a supplement to the King James. In 1 Timothy 4, 13, Paul wrote to his son in the gospel, Till I come, give attendance or attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. So let's take a closer look at this passage of Scripture. First of all, you notice that Paul placed an emphasis on biblical study. If you want to be a preacher of the gospel and if you want to be effective as a minister, then you must give yourself to the study of Scripture. If you don't like to read and you don't like to study, well, maybe you shouldn't be a preacher. Now, I'm not saying you have to have advanced training or some kind of degree, but I'm saying when it comes to the Word of God, you must be a student. You must become an expert in the Word of God. That's what the Apostle Paul says. Notice, he says, give yourself, give attention, pay special care to reading, which would be first and foremost the reading of the Bible. But we have many aids of studying Scripture, and there's nothing wrong with availing ourselves of everything we can to better understand God's Word. Certainly, uh, we are thousands of years distant from the Old Testament and a couple thousand years almost distant from the New Testament. What was obvious to the original hearers or readers is not so obvious to us sometimes unless we study terminology, uh, grammar, culture, history, geography, and so on. So we must first and foremost read and study the Bible, but also we must study other tools that can help us better understand the Bible. And then beyond that, I would say in our day that we need to read widely so that we understand what people in our culture are thinking. We need to understand where they're coming from so that we can relate the Word of God to their situation and their circumstances. All of that requires diligent study. And then notice, we must give ourselves to exhortation. So once we have read and absorbed and studied God's Word, we must prepare ourselves to transmit that Word. We must be able to exhort. We must be able to speak forth the Word. It must be in our mind and in our heart. We must absorb it. So it's more than just a casual reading, but we must read and study until God's Word becomes a part of us and then we can communicate it to others. So there, we must give attention to that communication process, to that exhortation process. So first of all, we read and study for our own spiritual benefit, and our own personal devotions, but we also read and study and prepare specifically for preaching and teaching. We must give ourselves to that. And if we have an ability to speak on the spur of the moment, or if we have an ability to inspire people, if we have an ability to tell good stories and funny jokes, and so we're a good speaker, entertaining, or well-liked speaker. That's not enough. We must work hard at the job of preaching and teaching. Give yourself, give attention to the process of exhortation. And then give yourself to doctrine, to the teaching that you've received so that you can in turn understand and teach others. Doctrine is important. Scriptural teaching is important. We say doctrine... We don't just mean a subset, but doctrine includes all of the important teachings of the Word of God. And as apostolics, we emphasize the oneness of God, the deity and humanity of Jesus Christ, the atoning sacrifice of Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection, the application of His atonement to our lives through the new birth, repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Thereafter, we preach a life of holiness, both inwardly and outwardly, separation from the world, the gifts of the Spirit, miracles, the importance of worship, open and demonstrative and heartfelt worship, prayer, fellowship, and on and on. All of these are points of doctrine. Doctrine simply means teaching. All of these are important points of teaching teaching 
for the New Testament church. And of course, there are many, many other important points, but the, the, the emphasis is we need to give ourselves to the study of doctrinal truth so that we understand it, we believe it, we're convinced of it, and we can effectively transmit it to others. That's part of the minister's preparation. Now, let's take a, a look further in verse 14. In addition to the study of God's Word, there is also a need to prepare ourselves spiritually. This passage shows the balance of word and spirit. If we are going to be effective ministers of the gospel, we must have preparation both biblically and spiritually. Sometimes people pit one against the other. Sometimes uh, people may look at those who spend a lot of time in study and preparation, maybe those who seek training in a Bible college or a graduate school or other type of college and disparage them and say, oh, well, you're people who are just looking at the letter. You know, you're, you're just depending on uh, human ability. Uh, you're not spiritual. You're not anointed. Well, that's a false dichotomy. We should be both. The Apostle Paul himself is a good example. He was trained at the feet of Gamaliel, who's known from Jewish history as one of the foremost teachers uh, uh, one of the foremost rabbis of the first century. So he had a graduate education in what we would consider Old Testament studies. At the same time, if you study his writings uh, and also his message in Acts chapter 17 as an example when he preached to the Athenians, he quoted from Greek philosophers and poets. He was well versed in the culture, even the secular and pagan culture of his day, so that he could relate to everyone. The Apostle Paul is a good example of a man who was obviously spirit-filled and spirit-led. He did many mighty miracles by the power of God. At the same time, he was a very diligent student of the Word of God and of his culture. So we need to reject that false dichotomy that you're either spiritual or academic, that you're either studious or anointed. We should not settle for one or the other. Sometimes people who are more academically inclined, in turn, will disparage those who seem to operate in the gifts of the Spirit or unusually anointed and put question marks around their ministry. Well, we need to reject both extremes and we need a balanced ministry of giving attention to study, and giving attention to spiritual life and anointing. We must have both. We cannot have a mature ministry without an emphasis on both word and spirit. So here in verse 14 and following, we find an emphasis on the spiritual side. Spiritual anointing and gifts. Notice, don't neglect the gift that is in you, which is given you to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. So here is a spiritual impartation. Notice it's in conjunction with ordination. I do believe there is a, a special blessing in ordination. Someone can already have a mature and approved and anointed ministry before ordination. But I do believe that is a scriptural step in moving forward to have the approval of both God and the church as represented by the elders, that helps us move into a new dimension of spiritual leadership and spiritual anointing. So in our ministry, we must seek the gifts of the Spirit as God enables. Anyone who is filled with the Holy Spirit, and especially anyone who is called to be a minister, could potentially operate any of the nine gifts of the Spirit mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12. Although perhaps not all of them, certainly not all of them all the time, but we should be open to any type of spiritual manifestation uh, that would be of a benefit to the body of Christ. And we should expect that supernatural things will indeed accompany our ministry. And much of that comes as we are submitted to spiritual leadership in our own life and as we receive the approval of the elders in our life, as we receive the laying on of hands and as we receive prophecy from those who are guiding our lives. Of course, each of us is accountable to God individually, but we respect the input of leaders, elders, and mentors, and that helps us move forward in the new spiritual dimension. He also says in verse 15, meditate on these things, give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. So here is the role of meditation and prayer. 
Of course, when we say meditation, we're not talking about pagan meditation. We're not talking about Hindu meditation, but we're specifically talking about meditation on God's Word and communion with God through prayer. We find plenty of examples of that in the Old Testament, in the Psalms, for example. In other words, he's saying pray and focus on your relationship with God. Pagan meditation is emptying your mind of thought, but biblical meditation is filling your mind with thought. It's a conscious meditation on God's Word and a conscious communion with God in prayer where you're talking to God and God is talking to you, where you're receiving insights from God's Word. So a very important part of ministry is to be in tune with God, to have a life of prayer and fasting, a life of spiritual communion with God so that you can operate in the realm of the Spirit. It needs to be a life of dedication and devotion. Notice see, when he says, give yourself entirely to them, I think he's speaking, first of all, of the study back in verse 13. He's speaking of the spiritual gifts and uh, prophetic utterance and laying out of hands of verse 14. He's speaking of meditation and prayer in verse 15. We are to give ourselves completely to these things. So we're talking about a life of dedication and personal devotion. The minister's effectiveness is going to be based on his personal relationship with God. It's not primarily based on what he can do in public. Now, God does bless us. Sometimes uh, we may not have time to study as we wish. An emergency comes up. Various things happen. And still we go to the pulpit. God uses us. We're anointed uh, and we're effective and people respond. And as we become more experienced, we learn how to communicate God's word effectively. We learn how to communicate with an audience. But we've got to be very careful not to coast on that because if we don't have the undergirding of personal spiritual dedication, the well will run dry. And perhaps we will stumble and fall, or perhaps we will hit a brick wall, so to speak. We'll come up against a circumstance where we, don't, we will not have the spiritual reservoir to draw from. We preach from the overflow. What I mean by that is we must have a reservoir full from our personal prayer, fasting, Bible reading, study, meditation, from receiving ministry, whether it be conferences or uh, through internet or DVDs or CDs where we receive apostolic preaching but we, and, and then other reading, we must have this reservoir constantly full and overflowing so that when we preach, we're not strictly preaching or teaching just from what we studied for that occasion, but we're preaching from our total spiritual life. But if we don't continually fill that reservoir, then we run dry. And then we find ourselves rushing to prepare something just for that time, studying or praying just for that next event. And that becomes increasingly difficult. But if we have an overflowing spiritual life, then any given occasion, even an unexpected occasion, we've always got something because we're preaching or, and teaching from the overflow. That's the kind of ministerial life and preparation that the Apostle Paul is describing. He also says that your progress may be evident to all. There needs to be diligence and visible progress. Other people should be able to see the hand of God upon your life, should be able to see the growth and development and maturity of your ministry. Now, verse 16, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. We must continue in the faith. And notice there are two components. It's vitally important for every minister to keep this in mind, from the young minister in training to the senior minister of many years experience. Because notice we are to continue in the faith. It's not just initial qualification and preparation, but it's the ongoing life of the minister at every stage. First of all, we must pay attention to our personal life, our personal spiritual devotions, dedications, and consecrations. The commitments we made when we started our ministry, the personal consecrations that we made as a new Christian or as a new minister, we don't need to compromise or sacrifice or give up those consecrations, but we must pay 
careful attention to our personal spiritual life, our pursuit of holiness, our faithfulness to the Word of God, and to the teachings that have been handed down to us from Scripture. Second, we must continue in the doctrine. And I've already alluded to this earlier, how important it is to be faithful to the doctrine that has been given to us. We must continue. We must remind ourselves, refresh ourselves, go back and study the basics. Don't take them for granted. But the distinctive apostolic truths that have made us who we are, that cause our movement to exist, that cause us personally to be saved and to enter into ministry, we've got to go back and renew our commitment, renew the foundation, continue in the doctrine. Why is it so important to continue to pay heed to our personal spiritual life and to doctrinal truth? Because the benefits also were twofold. We will save ourselves and we will save those who hear us. What we're talking about is important because this is the way that we continue to walk by faith and we continue to have that saving relationship with Jesus Christ. If we neglect either of these two areas, we can lose our own salvation even after having become a minister. And then... The other side of it is we're going to be effective in ministry of winning lost, discipling people, and seeing them saved in the end, raptured as part of the church. In other words, our ultimate goal is not measures of success as the world would measure success, or even as we might from external uh, views of how many people are in our church, or do we have a new building, how much income is in our church, and so forth. But our real goal is to save people. And to save people, we must guard our own spiritual life and we must be faithful to the doctrine. This is how we prepare ourselves as ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I would also like to speak for a few minutes about the minister's attitude. To do that, we're going to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 through 12. Here we find the Apostle Paul speaking about his relationship uh, to the church in Thessalonica. It's very interesting to see, perhaps as a case study, of how a minister such as Paul treated a congregation that he established and that he oversaw. So let's take a look in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. Now let me pause here and let's start looking at some of the qualifications or the qualities, I should say, that we can discern in Paul's ministry as we see it in action. First of all, he had a holy boldness. As a minister of the gospel, we must be kind, we must be patient, we, we should not be offensive in our approach or in our personality. But having said all that, we must have a holy boldness, not a worldly arrogance, not pride or ego or self-will. And we've, as we've already seen, those are not appropriate for a minister. But there does need to be a confidence in the gospel, a confidence in our calling, and a confidence in the anointing of God so that we approach ministry with a holy boldness. We're not afraid of the devil. We're not afraid of what uh, carnal people may think or say. But we are going to proclaim the word of God in all love and all kindness, but with clarity and certainty. Holy boldness is essential uh, for a minister if he is going to be faithful to his calling and successful in the terms that God measures success. Second, we notice that he was honest. His exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness or deceit. The ends do not justify the means. We cannot use deceitful uh, words or deceptive tactics in order to achieve what we consider a good end. We've got to be honest in what we say and also the way we say it. So even though Paul was intent upon opposing error and converting people with, to truth, uh, 
He always did so in an ethical, honest way. He did not try to deceive people or trick people or maneuver or manipulate, but he let the Word of God have its effect by simply presenting it. Now, picking up in verse 4, But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. Let's take a look at some of the qualifications we see here. Paul considered himself to be a steward of God's gospel. A steward is a manager or administrator. A steward is not an owner. Paul did not approach the church as if it was his church or if it was his gospel. Uh, the implication is he did not make it a personal fight. If people disobeyed him or refused to um, follow his teaching, he did not make it a personal fight with them. He did not become personally offended. It was not his gospel. It was God's gospel. Therefore, he felt a responsibility to be faithful to God. He couldn't change it. He couldn't compromise. He couldn't modify it to suit his preferences or the preferences of the people. He was accountable to God. Therefore, he did not seek to please people, but to please God. Now notice carefully, we're not talking about it being offensive in our personality or our approach. We're not talking about being rude and crude and disgusting. But we're saying that we cannot live in fear of people, nor can we change the message to please people. But we've got to please God. And of course, part of pleasing God is winning souls or seeking to win souls. So certainly, we're gonna, if we want to please God, we're going to treat the people that God has created in His image with love and care and respect. But the essential truth here is our message is not designed, uh, cannot be modified to please people. We must be faithful to the Word of God to present what pleases God because ultimately we'll give an account to God. Therefore, Paul was not intimidated by what people thought, nor did he seek to use flattery or to be influenced by flattery. He did not allow himself to be influenced by greed or self-gratification. And he did not allow himself to be influenced by a desire for glory or self-exaltation. Notice the attitude of the minister. He is God's spokesman. He is God's messenger. He is a steward of God's gospel. Therefore, he cannot allow his personal feelings or the feelings of people to deflect him from his calling, his message, and his task. He cannot allow uh, fear of people or flattery or greed to alter his message. Now, at the same time, Paul considered himself a stewardship of the people. All pe people are created in God's image. And, of course, all those who are born again are God's people in a special sense by the new birth. The minister is not the owner. The minister is the steward of the people. Therefore, he must treat them with respect. Notice in verse 7, But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children, so affectionately longing for you. We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil. For laboring night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, we preach to you the gospel of God. Notice the twofold stewardship. On the one hand, as I've already expressed, Paul was the steward of God's gospel and did not have the authority to change it. On the other hand, he was the steward of God's people. Therefore, he treated them with love, compassion, and respect. He was at the same time bold and gentle. The minister must be gentle with people, caring for them, loving them. Of course, we never compromise truth out of love, but as Ephesians 4.15 says, we speak the truth in love. This is a good test. If our love for people and desire to be kind to them causes us to water down truth, then we're not really fulfilling our role. And in the 
end, we're not really loving them either because if we're not telling them the truth that will save them or help them, then we're not really showing love to them as we should. On the other hand, if we're so committed to truth or our proclamation of truth that we're harsh and hateful, mean, unethical, unjust, unkind, then there's something wrong there as well. There must be a balance. We speak the truth, but always in love. Paul was bold, but at the same time, he was gentle. Notice the, the characteristics of his stewardship of people. He was gentle, he was nurturing and cherishing. Then he gives this image like a mother nursing her child. So sometimes we think of a pastor in a very authoritarian sense, maybe even in a masculine sense. But notice there is another image. Just as God transcends uh, masculinity or femininity, we cannot limit him by one image. Uh, so we understand the pastor, obviously, the preacher, is going to be a male or a female uh, and be faithful in that calling as God has created them. However, in their ministry, they cannot limit themselves to one type or stereotype. There is a time to be bold and courageous, which we might think of as a more masculine trait, or, but also there is a time to be gentle and nurturing and cherishing, which we might tend to associate with a feminine trait, but it's really neither, or it's, I should say it's both, that the good minister, the good pastor must be both. And here we see the image of the Apostle Paul, who could be very authoritative when the occasion required it and when Scripture uh, demanded it, but he could actually compare himself to a mother who nurses a child. That's what a good pastor should be like. And then he goes on to explain that he had great affection for them, great longing for them. So here you see that soft side, that nurturing side, more of the shepherd and caring side. And he devoted his life to others. He considered himself to be a servant of others. The pastor is truly a servant and must have a servant's heart. If you want to be a minister because of the position of authority, then you've got the wrong motive and the wrong understanding of what a true minister is. A true minister will devote his life to others and will serve and sacrifice for others. Verse 10, you are witnesses and God also how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And here it's interesting that we have the uh, example of a father. So actually, Paul, in the same passage of Scripture, describes himself as acting as both a father and a mother towards the people. So he devoted his life to them. He labored for them, not wanting to be a burden to them. In fact, you probably have an indication here he actually worked on a secular job rather than trying to live from them uh, not that he did not have the right to receive uh, support from them, but he did not want to uh, cause them to stumble or misunderstand the reason why he'd come to them. So he was willing to forgo his privileges and benefits and do physical manual labor just so he would not be misunderstood because his concern for them was paramount in his mind. And we see here in the last passage that I had just read to you, his Christian example. Let me just give you a list. A life of devotion, a life of righteousness, a life of blamelessness, a life of or a ministry of exhortation, and a ministry of comfort. Trying to be a servant and like a mother and father to his converts. That is the attitude that a true minister of the gospel should have toward the people he serves. 